What's up, everybody? Welcome to the show today. Today, we have Mark Henteman. Mark Henteman is an Emmy-nominated writer for the show Family Guy. He is a real estate investor. He is an investor in multiple things. He's just an all-around amazing guy, and he happens to be a partner of mine, or I'm a partner of his, in the company he started called Quantum Capital. Mark, welcome. I've been wanting to get you on this show. Thanks for having me, Jamie. I'm of- so excited. You look it. You look it. <laughs> <laughs> Family guy to the Tribe of Millionaires podcast. You just went up a tick. You went up a tick in that billion dollar <laughs> franchise to this. So good to have you. <laughs> let's, um, let's start with a little bit of backstory on you. So you've been a writer um, uh, pretty much your entire professional career. But let's go back a little bit further. You're a Cleveland guy. Where did this all start for you? In, was it in Cleveland? Was it in high school? Where did this, this thing, this creativity, this creative writing itch come from? Yeah, I don't know. I think I was pretty introverted as a kid and um, would draw. My mom said, like, you know, you were the easiest of, of our, my children because the other, your brothers and sisters were bouncing off the walls and you would just sit off in the corner drawing for like hours. And, uh, you know, maybe, maybe I had some, I was on the spectrum somewhere and, and just undiagnosed, but yeah, I could do that. I could just sort of like zone out for, for very long times. And I loved to draw as a kid. That was like my first thing. Um, but as I grew up, I guess, I guess I started to kind of like comedy and, and, and do some writing. Um, but I really didn't know what I wanted to do, but, but yeah, I guess I, I got, went to college and I majored as a, uh, organizational communications, which to this day, I don't totally know what that was supposed to be, but I started a, I was kind of bored. So I started a humor publication, um, at Miami of Ohio and, I spent a lot of my time in college just drawing cartoons and writing articles for that thing. And it was fun. We had a group of people, group of friends with me that would, would do that. And then after college, I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life or what I was going to do for my life or what I was qualified or, or suited for um, and bounced around to, to like random jobs. I was broke all the time. And uh, eventually one of my friends showed me this uh, art, uh, uh, ad in Spin Magazine, if you guys remember that. Uh, it was like uh, the, the second-rate Rolling Stone. But uh, it was, there was an ad for a, a greeting card writer. And he's like, hey, you, you're always broke. I'm tired of buying you, like having to pay for your beers. So uh, why don't you apply for this? And I looked at it, and I'm like, ah, oh, this is a national publication. There's zero chance of me getting this. But I had a bunch of cartoons that I had drawn in college, and I basically like put those cartoons on folded pieces of paper and wrote happy anniversary on the inside, and I sent it off, and they hired me. Um, I, I got hired at American Greetings, and I was in their alternative humor department. And what a weird way to uh, advertise. Like, what? who advertises for a, a, a greeting card writer in in a, like a a spin magazine. What is like that? Where, where all the greeting carders card writers, uh, read, is that the magazine they read, but I couldn't figure it out. But I guess when I got there, it had to do with, they were trying, it was the nineties and they were trying to be hip and, you know, on, on theme. And, and they had created this alternative humor department at American greetings. And that's what I was hired to work in it as a writer and illustrator. And that was contrasted with the uh, conventional humor department, which was next to us, which um, their job was to service all the licensed characters that American Greetings owned. So they had to write for Ziggy and Garfield and uh, Strawberry Shortcake. And they, and I remember seeing the manual for Ziggy. It was like this 200 page manual on what Ziggy would and would not say and all the rules and guidelines. And I was like, oh my God, <laughs> so anal about well, alternative, alternative humor. Let you just run, do, do anything. Um, so we had no, no rules, no even quotas for what, when we had to turn anything in, we were just kind of this experimental department in the 
remote corner of this massive company. Now, at this time, you were still uh, living in Cleveland or yes. Miami of Ohio, wherever yeah. you were back home. Did you was, ever did you ever have a draw toward stand up? I, mean, I think of comedy. Yeah, you know, like when I think of people that want to get into the into comedy that you, you usually hear about performance in some way, like, oh, I'm going to go do improv or I'm going to yeah. go do stand up or whatever. Was that ever a draw for you or something that you, you experimented with? I think I liked it, but I, you know, my, my, like what I was drawn to maybe in high school, like as, as far back as high school was Gary Larson, um, mm. the far side. Far side. Yeah. And I loved those. So I, I used to try to imitate drawing, drawing those or, or coming up with those. I just loved the way he, his drawing style and mm. his weird. It was just so weird. I loved that. I was always a little terrified of, uh, of, you know, getting on stage, I guess I'm introverted, but, um, I did ironically, while I was working at American greetings, I was invited. Our department was invited to, uh, to go to a college that had a, a comedy department and it was o Ohio university. And that the head of that ran something down in Cincinnati and he invited, I don't know why he picked me, but he asked me, he said, I want you to come down to our, our final show. And I want you to get up on stage and do like 10 minutes of stand up. And I was like terrified, but I'm like, I'll do it. I'll do it. It'll get me out of my, like my comfort zone. And, uh, and I did it. And, and no, I, and I, I promised I committed to doing it, but I got hired to write for David Letterman in the, before the event happened. Oh, wow. We're going to come to that here in a second. I, <laughs> I love this part of the story in New York and everything. Um, but I am curious about, you know, I, I don't know how to put it. You mentioned after high school, there was, you bounced around, you did different things. You didn't know what you wanted to do. And you would write though. Writing kept drawing you in. You, you stayed true to this sort of pure, I don't know, desire. I, I contrast it with me. So for me at a high school, it was, you got to go to college or you got to go get a job and that's it. Like, you know, just take a job, I, you know, your ambitions, I, I don't know. What are you going to do, you know, with uh, communications or speaking or whatever back then, right? Like mm, go be practical and go get a job. Did you feel or have that pressure to be quote unquote practical or were you, I mean, was it your parents or just the way you are, where you just pulled fully into now this is what I'm supposed to do. Right. Yeah, I feel like I'm lucky in that I sort of in that I sort of do. I there's other people that I've no I have no idea what they wanted to do. I think I remember so a, a little bit of both. I think I remember the first time I ever sort of expressed my my uh desire or or fondness for uh writing and comedy is I was in maybe in college or maybe even high school. I, I told my dad, I think I walked in, my dad was watching TV. And I think, I, I, I don't know, we got into this conversation. I was like, dad, I think I want to, I think I want to try to write comedy. And, and he just kind of shrugged and he's like, sure, go for it. <laughs> he's like, it's competitive. Know that it's competitive, but he's like, why not? And, um, and I remember that conversation, you know, uh, all, all these uh, years later, but, um, and he, he didn't say no, but I know when I got out of college and I didn't have a job and I was living at home, you know, it, he was nudging me like, Hey, uh, like, uh, okay. I hear, you know, I know you want to write. Um, I think I can get you a meeting with a friend who works for an insurance company and they may need someone to write brochures. <laughs> and I was like, that sounds so terrible. <laughs> It does. it does, but you're writing, Mark. Right? You're writing. You're writing. But you're brochures. doing your passion. <laughs> you're writing um, manuals. The writer you are today, obviously, you've honed your craft. But do you? Did you have? As you look back and think back, did you? As you learned, it's like anything. When you learn um, what made you successful or what makes you successful, you're like, oh, oh, yeah, okay. These are the structures. I kind of did that. I kind of naturally was inclined to do that. Did you find that? Like, are you much different of a writer from then to now? I mean, I know you're a different writer, but I mean, were you already, you know, on the 40 yard line, so to speak of like, wow, you, you have this natural inclination to towards certain structures that really work for a comedy writer. And now, you know, it's just honing your craft and repetition and all of that. Or was it like, oh my God, I had no idea. 
I think I had a sense of humor um, to a certain extent uh, through college and out of college. But when I got hired as a greeting card writer, um, I, I was doing, you know, like Gary Larson was my reference, the far side. And, and I was, I was just weird. Think of a weird concept. And, you know, there's rules and in, in structures to what, what he was doing. And I just tried to understand what those were. And I figured it out and, and you just then explore your own weirdness, your own personal weirdness through that channel. And that's what I did as a greeting card writer, illustrator. And then that, you know, the, the story there was um, I was getting bored after like a year and it wasn't bored. It was a fun job. It was a dream job in so many ways. Like, wow, I was getting paid to, to write and draw pictures. And there was no real pressure on me. Like nobody was breathing down my neck, like to turn in. But I, I also realized that I was in a cubicle and I looked out and there was 20 other cubicles around me. I'm like, I don't know that I want to spend the rest of my life here. And I, I remember hearing a statistic when I was at American Greetings that American Greetings had the second longest average tenure of employee there. And they were proud of that. But the average person spent like 30 years there. And, and I was like, I do not want to be here for 30 years. So after one year of, of being there, I started to think about like, what's my next move? And I know a lot of my colleagues there, um, you know, who were my buddies and friends and, um, they, a lot of them aspired to be, uh, syndicated cartoonists, you know, they, they were artists as well. And I think maybe more, uh, accent on the art artist side than the writer side. Um, and so a lot of them wanted to get their own syndicated, uh, cartoon and, and several of them have since then. Uh, but I was like, I don't know that I want to be a syndicated cartoonist, although, you know, it just seemed hard. And I was looking for any avenue, like what's my next step. And so I looked online and, and I was thinking of entertainment, like, I was like, maybe writing movies, maybe getting into television would be a way to go. And so I, I looked online for agencies. I knew you had to get an agent and I basically called the biggest agency in the world. It was the William Morris agency in New York. And I got their number. I called the receptionist and I said, uh, Hey, uh, hello. I'm, I'm interested. How do I submit material to, to the agency and just got like a three second, like send it to the mail room and just hung up on me. And, uh, and I was like, like got punched in the face and I was like, Oh God, like, yeah, this is, I am not suited for this. Like, or, <laughs> or this is way out of my depth, like to, to, for me to call the William Morris agency in New York city. Like, who am I? I'm nobody. Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, I did, there was something in my brain. Like, like I thought like, it's going to be, this is going to be a total waste of the dollar 80. I have to spend in postage, um, to, to send a submission, but I did, I was like, I kind of was like waffled over whether I should do it. I had been rejected by this woman. Um, but, uh, I did, I ended up taking like, you know, a bunch of my material and like putting it in a manila envelope and sent it to the, the mail room at the William Morris agency and forgot about it. And I remember tell, I remember the, the, discussions in my head <laughs> that were going on. It was like, just, just mail it and forget about it. It's you're going to lose, you know, that you're going to lose that $1 and 80 cents um, uh, and just move on, but you'll have done it. And I did and uh, went back to work and pretty much did forget about it. But then like a couple weeks later, maybe, maybe close to a month later, I got a call. Uh, there was a phone message from me when I got home from work and it was uh, someone from the William Morris agency. And so I called them back and this woman, her name is Betsy health. Um, she said, uh, hi, I'm uh, I found your material in the, uh, in the mail room. Um, she's like, I was an assistant. I, I am a brand new agent. I just got bumped up and I have zero clients. And so I went looking in the mail room and I looked at everything. I read everything in the, in the mail room. And she's like, I liked your, your material it was, was really good. And I think I had the advantage that it was visual. Like I had, I had drawings uh, uh, in addition to like script stuff. 
Um, and so I think that helped me. Um, and she said, well, would you be interested in writing for television or movies? And I said, of course I would. Like, what do I have to do? And she's like, well, um, you know, you got to figure out how to, to structure a, a script and tell a story, you know, that way. And if you do, and uh, you need to write something like that and give it to me and I'll use it as a calling card to shop you around the industry. And so I said, okay. And I went back and started to sort of try to absorb that and figure out what to do. Um, but, uh, and it was intimidating and daunting because I, I think I was going to write a Simpson spec script, which is a speculative script that just is your calling card. And, and it just shows people what your writing is like. However, like five days after I got off my first call um, with that agent, there was another message for me when I got home from work at home. You know, I was living with my parents. So I, I go back home and, and there was, she's, my mom's like, you got a message. And it was, it was uh, Betsy calling back. And she said, uh, I didn't tell you this, but I forwarded your cards to the late show with Dave, David Letterman and they want to meet you. How, how soon can you get up here? And I was like, what? And I was like, I'll be there tomorrow. And my mom gave me her airline miles uh, to, to fly up to New York. And they offered me a job. They said, you want to come work here? And I was like, yeah. Uh, wow. Wow. No. So you were you, this is why you were at American greetings. So you were yes. working there. You're sending this stuff in. Um, was this something where, how do I put it? Were you, were you interested in the not interested, but were you focused on that result or were you just simply focused on, I'm just going to write. I'm going to write and write and write like the process. I, I'm wh where, where did you spend your time, energy and effort? I mean, of course you mailed this to the William. Moore. You're always looking at, uh, yeah. I mean, you know, you got to display your stuff somewhere so that you yeah. can advance, but was it always like, I need to have this result or was it, I'm just going to keep writing comedy or was it a combination? I'm kind of curious where you focused. Yeah. I think it was mostly, I was, I had very bad marketing, personal promotion, like, you know, instincts or, or, that kind of thing. I was always writing. I, I figured out, I figured that the only way I would ever learn um, how to be a good writer, I believed in, you know, putting in the work and putting in the time and I enjoyed it mm -hmm. too. So it wasn't, it wasn't really work for me. It was, I could get absorbed, you know, it, maybe it's back to my like, you know, days as a kid as I could spend hours and hours and hours uh, like in that space because mm -hmm. I had fun. That's, I would rather do that than like go hobnob or, or, you know, meet in meet and greet, you know, people to, to advance my career. I, I just love that. And I think I've shared this with you. Like when I think back this is your, I mean, what, 22, 23, 24, somewhere in that range at this point, right? Age yeah. wise, you're like 20, 20. Yeah. When I think yeah. back to that time for me, it was all result focused, right? Like I got to get the job to get the house, to get to this, to get to that. Like I had only that in mind. And like the process was sort of like, okay, which one of these gets me that that's it. Like then that was the job. I, I got a job and I was good at the job. So, okay, then well, let me go. Right. But I never, I never allowed for at that age, maybe I didn't have the confidence or whatever to dive into what I authentically felt was me. And that's like a, a correction I'm making now in my forties. Right. And we've talked about that, but for you, even back then, you purely focused on now, this is who I am. This is what I love. This is my authentic uh, uh, drive and ambition. So I, I just, I like kind of accentuating that point. Cause I think, you know, some people, especially when they're in their forties or whatever, think like, oh man, if I knew when I was in my twenties, like when you did it, like, but that was when you were ready to do it for whatever reason. But if you're 42 or 43, it's, it's not too late for you to follow what you love doing right. and allowing that to take whatever and allowing any results to come to that, uh, that may just by following your authenticity. So, right. And maybe because I was in Ohio and didn't know, <laughs> never knew anybody in the entertainment business. Sure. Um, I always had an imposter, you know, I, I, an imposter syndrome. And part of the reason why I was doing that all the time is I didn't feel like I was, uh, you know, I was ready to be in it. Like I had to get good, um, you know, get good at the craft. And I had to learn all that. And, yeah. you know, I had a couple strokes of big luck. And, and I think that happened with Letterman. I mean, when I, when uh, I spent, you know, I spent my 10,000 hours drawing cartoons, you know, to, to, to do that. Cause I was doing it since high school and college. And, and now, 
at American Greetings. But then I got this big opportunity to go work for Letterman. And I remember trying to figure out how do you write for time? Like, how do you, because everything I had ever, all my comedy output was a, a one frame cartoon. Like, so it was a frozen moment that had to convey, convey a comedic premise. And, and, and I was, that's what I had wrapped my head around. But I remember like, you know, I could write the top 10 lists for, for David Letterman, cause it was all like conceptually, but like a desk piece, like <laughs> that was one of the things or a remote, you know, a remote was when you go down onto the street and you interact with someone or do some like yeah. gag and, and the, the desk piece was like him doing some bit. And I was like, totally flummoxed and like, what, like how two minutes, what happened? what goes into two minutes? Like they needed something that was two minutes or three minutes. Cause I, I had never written for time. Yeah. <laughs> that yeah. sounds so weird. Doesn't no, it? No, no, no. It makes sense. But I, I want to dive into this real quick. I just want to take it back to when you said imposter syndrome and luck, th th these two things popped up to me. What, what I find interesting about you is that you weren't a victim of imposter syndrome. You leveraged it. I think that's, that's an important distinction, right? Like you said, it was okay. Well, I need to be great. And you leverage this imposter syndrome to level up your game, which I think is a, is a, 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 a key distinction. And the yeah. luck thing I call BS on just because, you know, you, you, you had done the work, you had mailed the thing. I mean, I guess, you know, does Betsy or whatever her name is, you know, find you, but you were meant to be found because of the work you put in, like you, you put the energy toward this career. Um, Letterman, did you ever meet him? Were yeah. you ever in it? What? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Did you oh. have a relationship? I'm just kind of curious. What, what's Letterman like? I mean, <laughs> Letterman, by the time I got to Letterman, Letterman had, you know, been done the, the, let me see, it's called the late night with David Letterman at NBC. He had been at NBC for 15 years, I think at that time. And he had been at CBS for maybe like one and a half years by the time I got there. And if, so if you remember, um, if you recall the late nineties, there was, the, it was in the middle of at the height of those, uh, late night talk show wars. And it yeah. was Letterman and Leno had just, just been given the Johnny Carson slot at NBC and Letterman, you know, kind of thought that was his, his, he was entitled to that. But, but I think NBC thought that Letterman was too alternative to be at, at the 1130 slot. So they put him, they kept him at 1230 and then Conan showed up on the scene. So it was Letterman, Leno and Conan. Um, yeah. I, I saw Letterman every day and, and he was, um, he was good. You know, I mean, I don't know what to, I, you know, he, he didn't build relationships with his uh, new writers, but right. he was perfectly like, I always this characterized him as civil, you know, he kind of, he was very low key in the office. He usually had a baseball hat on with like pulled, pulled down over his eyes. So nobody would like try to engage him in conversation. Um, but he was perfectly nice. Um, What's the writer's room at, Let at Letterman? Like how many writers are there? And did you like, yeah. how, are you paid just flat? Or if you get a top 10 list that gets published, you get paid more? Like what's the room like? And, and how does, sure, the, how does sure. it work? Totally intimidating. Like uh, <laughs> walking into that room. When I got, when I went up there uh, to move in, you know, uh, I, you know, it was, it was crazy. It was like a heady experience, uh, you know, moving up to, to New York city and, you know, approach it, walking into the Ed Sullivan theater, you know, this legendary theater and, you know, the writers, the writing staff was on the top floor um, and, you know, entering that room. And that was the most prestigious, most decorated writing staff, probably in television. Everyone there had come off of the Harvard Lampoon and they all had 10 Emmys because, you know, in late night, there was only two other shows to compete with. So you were, if you stay there for 15 years, you're going to win Emmys, probably seven of those years in Letterman, like everybody there had like a shelf full of Emmys. So it was so intimidating. We're uh, walking into this room, you know, from as a greeting card writer. Um, but, uh, you know, tried to, tried to get my, my bearings and was you know, it cutthroat? Were they, were they, did they like, I got these Emmys kid, like, you know, you just do what you do. But, or was it just, no, Hey, you're a writer. We're writers. We're no, go. it was pretty, everybody was cool. Um, yeah. Uh, 
yeah, they, they were, I was intimidated by them. I don't think they at all tried to intimidate me. Um, but yeah, it yeah. was, it was thrilling and I was scrambling like, like to learn, you know, I, I was yeah. like, I gotta, I gotta learn this. So we'll advance the story a bit in the interest of time. And I know, I know for you, Letterman ended up kind of maybe, maybe reshuffling and getting rid of a bunch of writers. You were one of them in this whole late night war thing. Yeah. So you were there maybe about a year, if, if I recall right, um, before, before you let go, you meet your now wife, you have no money. She has less than no money and you hit LA. Right. So you head out to the other side of the country because there's really no sure. other writing opportunities in New York. Sure. Then you meet Seth MacFarlane. How did yeah. you meet Seth MacFarlane? Tell me that story. And, you know, I it might squeeze some part of that in there. So, like, sure. yeah, it was it was during um, it was during the late night talk show wars and Letterman slid in the ratings. And uh, if you recall that he was kind of yeah. losing to letter Letterman and it was very publicized. Uh, and so they fired the executive producer and a new executive producer came in and started cleaning house. And he, basically they ended up cle cleaning house uh, of all the new writers. The, the old guard stayed um, and, and they had been there for a long time. And all the new writers got sort of like, you know, I got called into the office and like, uh, thank you. We're not renewing your, your uh, uh, we're not re renewing your contract. And it, that was after probably, you know, not even a year, it was like 10 months in. And I remember just walking out of that, uh, the Ed Sullivan theater onto Broadway and just in a total daze and being like, oh my God, like just a, such a gut punch. And I had just moved my entire life up there. I had signed a lease and like, what am I going to do? And I was in a daze and, um, you know, I think in a, I, I, you know, I had never been so overwhelmed and sort of like a swirl with like panic and, and, and dejection. Um, but I, I kind of said, like, I remember thinking like, I remember thinking like, okay, you know, I, I kind of saw myself from above walking down Broadway and I'm like, like this, this swirl of anxiety and fear and terror. And I'm like, enough of this, like, you know what? fuck those guys. I'm going to like, you know, maybe I wasn't ready for this. Maybe I got this like stroke of luck and I wasn't prepared, but I'm going to, I'm going to go straight home and I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to work harder than everybody in that room. Like a Harvard degree doesn't make you funny. Um, and I'm going to go in and get to work and, and wake up at the crack of dawn and, and write until, you know, midnight, if I have to, 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 to get better than all those guys, all those. I was, I, there was a part of me that was bitter and that drove me um, to like, it was time to put in the work and, and learn how to write for, uh, for film and television, like write scripts. And I so, yes, that. I love that. Yeah. My wife, my, my wife, current wife, I knew her in Cleveland. I knew her in college and she moved, up, she had moved up to New York to join me. And we both, decided to go to LA because my, my agent, Betsy at the time, she goes like, you know, look, um, you know, you got, it sucks. What, what happened over at Letterman, what has been happening to some of their staff staffing changes. And she's like, I checked, you know, you're in New York. There's Saturday night live. They're all staffed up. There's Conan. They're all staffed up. Um, and, uh, and she said, I, I would recommend you know, if you're going to stay in this business, you probably need to move to LA. And so I had never been to LA in my life, but, um, my wife and I, I, you know, Lynn and I, we moved out to California and, uh, and yeah, I'm in California. Uh, and I, uh, I got a meeting there. My first meeting that I got there was with Fox because, uh, my agent said, you know, you, you've got all these cartoons. I'm going to, I'm going to call you an animator. And uh, I can get you a, a get you some meetings that way. And so she got me one at Fox because Fox does animation. And I actually pitched a show to them in that meeting and they bought it. And so that that show ended up on uh, MTV. It was called Three South. And then at the same meeting, they said, you know, oh, by the way, you should meet this guy. You should meet this other guy like he's an animator, too. And uh, he's right out of college and he's starting this show and we're, we're interested in launching this show with them. 
And so I met with Seth McFarlane and uh, we talked and we both loved Gary Larson and, and we kind of had some of the same influences. And he was like, you should, you should come work on this show. And, uh, and he handed me a DVD of his, like his short, his animated short that was going to become family guy. And, uh, and I took it home and, and put it in and, and watched it. And I was like, this show is going nowhere. Like, why? I, I, what was it about the show? That well, was it was going- really rough. Um, it, and it was like, oh, this is like a, it's kind of trying to be the Simpsons, but it's not the Simpsons. You've but, been, uh, have you ever been more wrong in your life? <laughs> probably, probably not. That's yeah, that might be, <laughs> but I was, fortunately I took the job. I needed a job. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so now yeah. the, the other show real quick, cause I don't know much about it. What was it called? Three self. It was called three South. And that was basically my corridor in college, my freshman corridor. And I wanted, I just had the thought, like, it'd be fun to do. It was it. an animated series on MTV. How long did that last? It lasted one season. Okay. All right. But you get paid for that. And then you're getting paid for Family Guy, but Family Guy's not going to go anywhere um, in right. your estimation. Yeah. <laughs> so, so what we, do you do? What do you do next? You're in LA. You've got this, you're sore over this being fired and you're bitter and, you know, yeah. screw those guys, all that stuff. And now you're in LA. You've got this, uh, you've got this uh, show that's not going to go. That's not yeah. going to go anywhere. What yeah. do you do? I was sore and, and also broke. And, and, you know, I had woke, would ba- bolt awake in the middle of the night. Like I'm, I'm used to Ohio. Like I'm not used to New York and LA and having, you know, having rent to pay and all that stuff. So I was, I was convinced that LA, my LA career would be, you know, long stretches of unemployment with like sporadic jobs. And Mm. so I, and I didn't think family guy had a big, (laughs) much of a future. So I took my first script payments on family guy and bought a duplex. And, uh, and yeah, that in Mike Henry, uh, who plays Cleveland Herbert in Consuela, he was my first tenant. And uh, he made fun real of estate. Me. Why, why a duplex? Oh, I'm sorry. What were you gonna say? He made fun of you. He made fun of me for being a landlord, and I threatened <laughs> to evict him all the time. <laughs> but why real estate? What made you all of a sudden think real estate was a good idea? You know, gosh, I don't even know. Like, what what was it? Um, yeah, you know what is? I had my landlord had raised the rent, and I went looking for another apartment. And on a Sunday morning. Uh, Lynn and I went to an open house for an, another apartment. And as we came out of it, there was an open house for a, a home across the street. And we walked in cause it was Sunday. We had nothing to do. And there was a, an, a, a, an agent there, a real estate broker there. And we talked to her and, and I said, uh, yeah, I I'm, uh, I'm a writer, um, in the entertainment business. And, and I was like, I have like 40,000, I had two written two scripts for family guy. And I think each of them was a $23,000 payment. So I think I had $46,000 to my name. Um, you know, not including some debt that we had racked, racked up. Uh, but she was like, you should put that money towards a mortgage. And I remember telling her like, are you kidding me? Like, that's the last thing I need. You know, I'm into this volatile business. Uh, I, I can't afford you know, to have a mortgage, the obligation of a mortgage. And, but we talked and I, eventually I got to like, okay, if you can give me some kind of stability, like if, if the only way I would buy real estate is if it would have to be the best investment I have ever made. And it would have to be something that could give me some stability for when I'm unemployed. And she said, well, all right, there are, there are properties that fit that. And she's like, you know, a duplex, get an investment property. I'm like, all right, well, that, that kind of makes sense to me. And we parted ways and she, um, she called me a couple of weeks later, you know, I didn't know that I would ever hear from her. And she said, I found the property you need to buy. Um, and she said, it's a duplex. And so I met her and, uh, it was this rundown, um, you know, old, had great bones to it, a great architecture from the twenties. And it was in a, in a up and coming area. And she was like, you should buy this. And I was like, really? Uh, and and I, I had the money to do it. So I got into a, a, I made an offer on it and there were 15 other buyers and we got into a bidding war and every day it was just panic and calling the broker, like, should I go? And she's like, I think you should go up, go up. 
And yeah, long story short, um, it was listed at $379,000 and I won the bidding war by paying $435,000 uh, and immediately thought I had made a huge mistake. Um, yeah, that's a lot. That's a big chunk over percentage wise. I can't do the math in my head right now, but what, like 20% more than what the, what the purchase price of the home was or the listed price of the yeah. home was. And you had $46,000 to your name at this point. Yes. Yeah. So pretty much like what, like five or 10% down, 5% down or an FHA three and a half percent down, whatever it was. Uh, yeah. I did a 10% down. Um, I didn't know about the FHA. I wish I had, but yeah, I put down 40, 46,000, pretty much everything I had. Yeah. Yeah. Put the money down. Um, what happened with that property? So you own this property. How long did you own it? Do you still own it? What, what happened with that? I owned it for five years. I renovated it and, uh, you know, it was a good time in the market. I mean, as is such a common, uh, experience for investors as you think, I thought we were at the top of the market in 2000. Um, cause I had been in New York, uh, and everybody talked about real estate and, and how boom, how much money they were making on it. And I didn't have two nickels to rub together. Um, but, uh, I, you know, I thought we were at the top, but we sold it five years later, the market it was still going upward. And yeah, what I had bought for 435,000, I sold for 1.27 million. They are making a good living, a family guy at this point. And on top of that, now you've got seed money for the next deal, right? So yeah, this and, launches, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, I was just to say, and also, you know, I learned, I had educated myself while, uh, while owning that duplex, the five years and, and, mm -hmm. You know, I had approached my accountant about, you know, about some of the tax advantages. And, and yes, we had, we were able to pull out $500,000 tax free and then 1031 exchange the remainder of, of the, the profit on that into uh, two other properties, a four unit and a 14 unit. Wow. So four and a 14, all in LA, all in LA. Yep. Um, Okay. I, I I'm, I'm thinking of two different ways to go with this right now. Cause I want to, I want to, I want to be, I want, there's like three avenues to travel down. So you're all in LA at this point. Um, this is what, like, Oh, five, Oh, four, somewhere in that range that you've bought these, these, uh, these two additional properties. Yes. And now you're off to the races on, on acquiring real estate. Totally hooked. What was the, what was the, what was the progression of this? So you self fund this, these first two properties, you reposition, I'm assuming, and either exit or hold and refinance, whatever it is. But you're at scale now. Quantum has over 150 million in assets under management, right? To, to today, yes. we kind of flash forward to today. Yeah. So, how did you start to steamroll that? How did you start to build that? Was it just that, like, market takes me up, I sell a refi and buy more, or were you taking on investors? What did that look like? Um, the first, the first probably eight properties I bought were all 100% owned. And, and I was just, I was committed to, you know, the, the beauty of real estate is, um, you know, the moment I sold that duplex for, uh, for a gain of about $900,000, uh, I never wanted a fancy car. I never wanted anything like that. I was deferring all of that stuff. I wanted to put all of my money into real estate because that solves my biggest pain point, which was my, you know, anxiety of, of being broke and, and destitute. And, you know, I thought it was a, a, a virtuous cycle that I, I was pumping everything I had into buying more real estate. And I, I loved it. And I knew that I, I was like, this is what I'm going to do until I'm a hundred. Mm -hmm. um, and I, and I, I remember thinking like by 2005, I had been so working so hard to get into the entertainment business I also was thinking by 2005, I was thinking whenever the entertainment business wants to spit me out, so be it. I'll, I'm going to do real estate. Um, I've got, I've got the fallback. I love it. Um, so I, I was buying properties in LA, multifamily properties in LA. I believed in scale and was always trying to get as much as I could, but I had limited funds. So I would get maybe an eight to 12 unit tops, I think um, at that time. Um, but, and I was also becoming an evangelist for real estate investing to all my, uh, writing colleagues. I would say, dude, you know, we're in such a volatile business, like do yourself a favor, like buy something. And I would find properties and, and say, Hey, here's a fourplex. 
in a great up and coming neighborhood, you can, you can afford this. Um, you know, you'll get a loan, do it. And to my surprise, nobody would take that step. Nobody would do it. And it always kind of puzzled me, but eventually they, uh, they said, you know, you, you won't stop talking about this. Why don't you find something and we'll, can we pitch in money? And so that's, that's what I did. I started putting together partnerships with writers. And one of the first ones, ironically, was we, the biggest one is I think I bought, brought in like seven other writers and it was in 2008 Ooh. and uh, we removed contingencies and like two weeks after I removed contingencies, Lehman Brothers crashed, followed by Bear Stearns in the entire global economy went into a, a deep recession. And wow. I was like, oh shit. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm never going to hear the end of this. I see these guys, I see these people every day. <laughs> but it, it turned out okay for you through that, for them, for everybody on that. And that's interesting to me. There's two different things here for me that I want to ask about. One, how did you survive 08? Let's start with that. So you have this property, you have other properties as well. I mean, you're, you're building yeah. a portfolio yeah. at this point. And from what I understand, there's been, there was no losses on anything that you owned or syndicated or partnered with, uh, even through that crash, even through the 08 crash. How, what were, were there a couple of, a couple of things that you, uh, that you learned or did that made it so that, you know, you didn't have the losses that many other people experienced in that time. Yeah, I think, and I didn't know this, this was not pre-planned at all because my funds were always limited because my funds were always limited. And because I believed in scale, um, I was always trying to get the most units for the least amount of money. Mm. And so I was buying B and C class, heavy value ads. And, uh, and yeah, that was, that became the tier of the market that I became kind of skilled at. And I was, I was buying those and yeah, we went in, I actually sat on the sidelines. I, I didn't, I, I thought there was something crazy and dangerous happening um, in like 2006 and seven, as we were approaching 2008 and I had stopped for two years, I didn't buy anything for two years, but then the market slid and it slid by 15% and then it plateaued. And I thought, um, now's my chance. Like it's, it's down and I'm going to get in. And that's when I found this, a 16 unit property that I brought in all these other investors and uh, the sellers were suing each other. It was it was a it was kind of a fire sale, and uh, we bought it. And then everything collapses. The world financial system collapses, and I'm like, oh crap! You know, I'm, I'm never going to hear the end of this. But uh, but to my surprise, we were able to ride that out. And all my other properties rode it out. And I think the biggest you know, the only sort of bump in the road that I recall, and it was really not much it, is that the bank, the bank who loaned us uh, to that property during the recession, they came to me and said, you know, we're now, we're now reappraising every property that we have. And now you're, we see, we've calculated that your property has gone down. We want you to increase the loan, your, your down payment so that you can meet our new debt coverage ratio. Does that make sense? It does. Cause yeah. they had like a, they wanted a 75% LTV at all times. And, yep. you know, with the price declines across the whole market, they wanted us to do it, but it was nothing. It was really nothing. I was running family guy. I'd gotten promoted to uh, run family guy at the time. So I, you know, it was, it was easy and everybody, we were all working. I mean, that's, that was un, one of the things I learned about entertainment by being in the entertainment business is when recessions hit, people increase their television watching because they can't afford to go out. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, it's true, right? You, you become more, more desirable in one space and then you can, you can buy at a discount in the other. And I like that never buy retail essentially, right? You were buying value add opportunities and uh, not buying top of the market, at least in, in the niche that you, that you serve. Advance it to today. What does quantum capital look like? You can include me in this, whatever, but yeah. advance it to today. What does quantum capital look like uh, for you? What, like, and what do you see the vision of it as? Uh, you know, it's just something I'm, I'm excited to do. It's, it's been a blast. Uh, I started quantum capital, I guess 
you know, I guess informally with my writing, uh, uh, my writing colleagues investing with me, but then I, I formalized, you know, called it quantum capital probably around 2014. Um, and, you know, we, you know, I built, a, you know, I, I hired, you know, Nick and we've got a team of about what, six, six of us uh, yeah. all together right now. Yeah. And, and I, at some point, maybe around 17, 2017, I had my entire portfolio was in LA and, Mm -hmm. you know, a lot of people say you can invest in LA. I think, you know, yeah, yes, you absolutely can. People do it all the time. People who are immigrants who came to the, to California with no money, you know, my, uh, my handyman uh, owns like a warehouse and, you know, you can get into the game um, and, and rent control is, is manageable. Um, uh, So I think, you know, a lot of, there's a lot of misconception about the California market. I think people succeed incredibly in that market all the time. So I had a portfolio in California, uh, but I also wanted to diversify and, and partially because California has earthquakes. I don't want to have every property I have. And I was buying some, some older properties too. And so I wanted to get into Austin and I moved into Austin and, and, you know, Nick was in Austin. So one of our key partners, as you know, uh, Jamie, um, Nick, he was in Austin and we started buying in Austin and then we moved to Denver and we, today, uh, quantum capital is in primarily those three markets. And we still buy the same product that I have bought since, uh, you know, since 2000 for now 20 going on like 24 years is uh it's value add it's all value add we like b and c class uh my experience with a class you know a class is ru- is is nice it's great it's doing well right now my experience like during the 2008 recession is that a class rents dropped precipitously and a lot of a class renters moved into b class and c class because they were experiencing job uh cuts and uh salary cuts and at the same time there was foreclosures happening, this wave of foreclosures and, and the debt markets freezed up. So getting loans was hard. So you had another big uh, demographic that was moving out of their homes and into, uh, they were moving into BNC class. So I like that. I like workforce housing in prime markets and that's what we've been doing. And, you know, we, we call our fund, you know, the growth momentum fund, because that's been our strategy all along is I'm not necessarily a cash flow investor. Um, cash flow is just a, a, a byproduct of, of, you know, sometimes it's a byproduct of, of being in a higher cap rate market, um, which is sometimes riskier. Um, I think, I think it's lower risky, it's lower risk to, um, to be in, in, you know, a, a really strong growth market and, uh, and, you know, benefit from the, the appreciation. That's what do you see? Like you mentioned that, that sense in 06, 07, that something was coming and, you know, you were, uh, you know, building at that point. Now you mentioned you're a two decade long investor. You're, you know, you've got a lot of, I mean, you and I talk all the time and I mean, you're so, dug in, I, you, you know, uh, the connections you have, the, the stuff you read, I mean, this, you live and breathe everything having to do with real estate, multifamily, workforce, housing, the markets that we're in, all of that stuff as, as quantum capital, do you see anything fundamentally right now in, in the, you know, wherever that poses risk to the valuation in the real estate market, to values in the real estate market right now? Like, is there anything that's, that's, that's um, fundamental. I mean, you know, it's it's expensive right now, but do you see anything fundamentally that that creates potentially a dip in the next year, two, three years, whatever? And I know you don't have a crystal ball, but just your 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 thoughts. I mean, just off the top of my head, right now, uh, in, with interest rates climbing, I think there's likely to become a stalemate uh, between buyers and sellers because you know, as you well know, prices are, are as high as they've ever been in terms of cap rate compression. And so sellers have these high expectations of, 
of cashing in 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 a big way but as the interest rates climb upward those cap rates are go- going to have to expand um to for the the deals to make any sense and a lot of a lot of people are buying deals that make no sense right now but um but those who who require a deal to pencil out in any sort of meaningful way uh uh, they need they need the cap rate to expand, and you know if cap rates are down to threes right now in, in the threes, they're going to have to go up to the four four and a half or five, uh, you know depending on how much interest rates rise. And I think just this week they went up, or maybe it's the last two weeks they've gone up eighty basis points, um, and so that's that's significant. That's a big jump, and and yeah, I guess that's my in the immediate uh, uh, present and future, near future, I think I, I think there could be a, a, a freeze of transactions because the sellers are going to be like, what happened to that big price that I was going to get? And now it's it's been knocked down. You know, they're going to have to swallow a little bit of ego or, or, or whatever it is, ex- expectations and lower their prices to make transactions happen because i think buyers any buyers that are are requiring a, a deal to pencil out are going to are going to hold their you know they're going to stick to their guns and yeah, we're, we're we'll recording see. this late march this will probably be released in the next couple of months so we'll see your prediction okay, right. right now may be true by the time this comes yeah, out right so. right yeah we'll see <laughs> we shall see um, you touched on LA. I was going to ask you about that, and I'm glad you did. You know the the idea that um, that uh, uh, you can invest there. Let me ask this question. Then I want to I want to pivot back once more back to your writing career and kind of kind of end it on that. But uh, Go Abundance, you joined a little over a year ago now, if I'm not mistaken. Yep. Um, four of the four of the people that are on the general partnership team at Quantum, you, me, Nick, Benoit, are all Go Abundance members, um, which is interesting. I you know, but <laughs> what. What is GoBundance? Why join GoBundance? What has it meant for you? What has it been for you? What, what's the value for you of being part of GoBundance? Yeah, prior, you know, maybe six months before I joined, I I'm totally not, you know, outside, disconnected with the world of, I guess, professionals who network and and join masterminds and all that stuff. I had never heard of a mastermind. I guess I don't know why writers don't do that. It's not it's not a big thing in the entertainment business. But so initially I was like, what is this thing? What it, uh, you know, I was starting to do podcasts in the real estate space as a guest. And a lot of people would mention go abundance. And, uh, you know, one of them was, uh, you know, I did the bigger pockets and, and both David and Brandon said, you should join this thing. You should join this thing called go abundance. So I was intrigued, like these are smart guys, but what is it? What is it? And, and, uh, you know, I joined, uh, you guys were in Tahoe. Go Abundance was in Tahoe, and I wanted to go skiing, and and <laughs> and so I I uh, signed up, and I thought, all right, I'm going to try this. This is a new uh, a new arena for me, and yeah, to my I, I had skepticism, but I, I you know I've met some of the most high caliber people I've met, um, and I'm so you know there's people that are just great role models. Um, floating around uh, go bonus. Not you, of course, Jamie. Zero <laughs> percent me. It's the other way around. You're the role model for me. <laughs> I stay in your universe as much as I can. <laughs> but I think it's uh, I think it's cool. Like yeah. I, I, the pillars are great, and and yeah, just dialing in on your passive investing, your your uh, your life goals, your relationships and, and your service and all that stuff. It's like, you know, laying out what are the most important things in life and then start being intentional about all of those. And you've got a great chapter in SoCal too. I'm kind of envious. We're trying to build something like that here in Michigan, but uh, Brett Levine and, and yeah. that whole crew, you guys do a bunch of stuff together. Yeah. So. Brett's awesome. Really cool. Um, back on the writing side real quick. What, um, what, so you've been writing for what, 20 22 years, I guess now with, with family guy, you were a showrunner at one point. Um, you've worked on some movies as well. Can you talk about some of the movies you've been on either as a, as the lead writer, a writer, credited writer, whatever it may be. Um, you know, I've never really pursued the movie, uh, business. I've heard it's, it's rough. I've heard it's like, you know, very sporadic. I think 
in, in the culture of enter of the entertainment business, a lot of people try to get into television because it's a steady gig mm. and, and movies are feast or famine. You get, you get a project here and there. And I've been lucky to be consistently employed in uh, television. Uh, but I did have a chance to uh, uh, do a little bit of punch up on the original Ted movie. Uh, and then more recently, uh, I wrote uh, a, a script for a reboot of The Naked Gun. And, uh, oh, you know, no, Seth no, no. had had uh, come to me uh, and asked to write it. He had he had uh, uh, he had done a movie, uh, the Western that he did it was called A Million Ways to Die in the West. Liam Neeson was the, the villain in that movie. And uh, apparently Seth said said, uh, you know, a, a, a year ago or something that uh, Liam called him and he said, I'm sick of doing these thrillers. Find me a comedy. And, uh, and I think on the phone right there, Seth was like, you should be Frank Drebin, uh, from uh, naked gun. And he's like, count me in. <laughs> that is uh, that's a good Liam Neeson impression, by the way, <laughs> that's my terrible. That was good. You kind of got dark and deep. I like that. That was good. I have a set of skills, um, uh, right? a very specific set of skills. And you've got some voice work that you've done on Family Guy too, right? We 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 all know you as something. You talked about this in uh, where were we? Steamboat, <laughs> I think, on stage. Uh, for those I, that weren't there, what's uh, what's your what's your voiceover work on on uh, Family Guy? I started by getting cast as all the brain damaged people, and I'm uh, I'm Opie, one of uh, <laughs> Peter's coworkers. I play. I love how ostrich. you say that straight face, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> But yes, keep going. <laughs> I play an ostrich uh, who goes, ha ha. And that's basically how I, they were making fun of me because that's how I laugh at people's jokes in the writer's room. <laughs> is that authentic or is that more of like, I'm going to be nice. I'll give you a little laugh here. <laughs> maybe, maybe somewhere in between. It's like, <laughs> uh, but I think, I think Seth, uh, at, at some point he was like in the corner of the room, like just drawing. And, uh, and I think, and then he kind of eventually like he turned the page and, and drew showed this like ostrich. And he's like, this is, this should be you as a character. Uh, it, it, because I, I guess he was listening to how I laugh at people's jokes <laughs> and he goes, just do your laugh. And that'll there's be a great. Be there's a character. couple of great compilations on YouTube of the ostrich laugh. So you're, uh, you're famous oh, yeah. in that regard. You didn't even know it. <laughs> you didn't even know it. Um, all right, let's end this on the GoBundance card game question. Uh, we're going to skip the one sheet stuff because we're, we're one long on time and two, um, there's so much in this episode, which thank you for, for pouring so much in here. Uh, the question is, what is one of your most cherished memories? One of my most cherished memories. It's a big question. Yeah. Um, I, I think, uh, I took my daughter, uh, I took my daughter to Iceland when she was like, uh, she was entering high school. And, uh, I think my wife was busy with the twin twin girls and, you know, she was going through a kind of a tough time and, and just during a summer, we kind of planned it spur of the moment, went to Iceland, Brussels, and then Amsterdam and it was just her and me, and she was probably 14 years old or something like that. And we just had a blast. And I'll always remember that. What a bonding experience. Amazing. Mark, where can people learn more about quantum, about you, us, whatever, quantum capital? Yeah. <laughs> where do you yeah, want to direct folks big, to learn more? Big part. Um, <laughs> you can learn, uh, you can, uh, we have a website, quantumcapitalinc.com. You could also reach out to me at quant at mark at quantumcapitalinc.com. And also if you're a GoBundance member, uh, reach out on the uh, Go Suite. There you go. There you go. Mark Henteman, always a pleasure. Thanks for doing this with me. Thanks, Jamie. This was fun. Thanks for Absolutely. having me on. Yes, yes.